Howdy, friends. I spent two and a half hours in an MRI machine yesterday. And I shared that on Facebook, you know, because we share stuff that we do that other people might be able to connect with. And the response to that post was, by and large, holy cow, I could never do that. My goodness, that's a long time. I get claustrophobic. I couldn't do that because of my anxiety. And I wanted to share with you how I was able to do that. Because it's a, it's a skill, there are some truths about the way the body and the brain works that are absolutely essential for people that have to deal with anxiety or negative self-talk or anything like that. And for starters, I've been getting MRIs on and off for the past 30 years. You know, I had cancer when I was 18, I've got MS, and I've had uh, injuries that required MRIs. I blew my knee out 20 years ago. But when I realized that these MRIs aren't a once-in-a-lifetime thing for me, and I had a lot of anxiety and hyperventilating and all that fun stuff, that it made sense for me to learn how to handle that better instead of dreading it the entire time. It's coming with anticipation, anxiety, thinking, oh my god, I hope the sedation works. I remember last time it was so terrible and I'm going to be panicky. You know what I'm talking about because you probably do that to yourself. So I didn't want that to be my reality, you know, of anticipation, panic, freaking out, then talking all about how terrible it was after it was all over. What the hell sense does that make? Why torture myself? So I'm always in search of ways to be able to handle those adversities or those stressful situations more effectively. So there's that. Secondly, there's my ongoing lifelong pursuit of how to alleviate my own self-induced suffering and the suffering of others, meaning all that stuff we do to make ourselves miserable. So I focus heavily on cognitive and spiritual and also physiological strategies like breathing strategies. And something to understand about anxiety and its drivers is, yes, there are medical people who have created all these wonderful little labels, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, and all that stuff, to convince people that these are things, that these are static entities that have somehow invaded your system and that you are stuck with for the rest of your life, and it's bullshit, okay? Now, it's not to say there is not some biological foundation for panic and anxiety, because these things have been studied. Clearly, there's something going on, but... I want you to, and I'm not talking about PTSD here, okay? I'm talking about run-of-the-mill, everyday rumination, anxiety kind of stuff. It's important to understand that, by and large, the worst parts of our panic and anxiety are an escalation of the original symptom because of our imagination. Because between our ears, we freak out, we god awfulize it, and we make it into a catastrophe where it simply wasn't warranted, and it certainly wasn't going that direction. So you need to not only get a handle on the crap between your ears, you also need to get a handle on the physiological reaction to it. And this is how you do it, okay? First, understand, and I've talked about this before in other videos, your brain does not know the difference between a real and an imagined event. That's one of the reasons we can throw ourselves into a panic with our thoughts alone, when there's not a presence of an actual threat. And that's the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear means the tiger is running at you, drooling with its jaws bared. Anxiety is you are afraid there may be a tiger. And what if that tiger runs at you with its jaws bared? And what if you can't handle it? And what if you die? And so on and so forth. That's anxiety. So being in an MRI tube, although uncomfortable, it's not life-threatening. It reminds you of being helpless, feeling trapped, feeling stuck. What if I can't get out? That's all your internal dialogue, okay? And if that's not something you have a handle on yet, well, how can you begin to have a handle on that? Because it works more for, for just the MRI. It can help in socially awkward situations, job interviews, having an uncomfortable conversation with a loved one. There are all kinds of situations like that where your imagination can really make things worse. So what I discovered that helps me in the MRI tube is a combination of cognitive and 
neurobiological. The neurobiological part is a breathing hack that tells the autonomic nervous system. Okay, I'll simplify that. There's a big nerve that goes from your brain stem and connects to your bowels and your heart and your lungs and it regulates all those automatic things that also need to be done differently in the event of panic. So the vagus nerve detects there's a danger. It increases the heart rate, it increases the blood pressure, it increases the breathing rate, it suppresses digestion because that is not a priority when you're fighting for your life. But when you tell yourself in your brain, oh my God, there's a danger, this is terrible, this is awful, it tells the vagus nerve, okay, kick into fight or flight. You have to prevent that from happening. If you can't really quiet this, you can still hack the vagus nerve, and this is how you do it. There is a breathing technique. It's pretty straightforward, surprisingly simple. You take a quick breath in, and then you slowly let it out. Because this is something that's really cool about the, the fight or flight response. Part of it's automatic, part of it you can control. And that's the happy balance because you're not always paying attention. Sometimes your body needs to be able to pick up dangers for itself and get you to respond before your brain even knows what happened. You know, ever see something falling or coming at you and you quickly step aside and then you don't realize until after the fact that you actually took action? Because it wasn't a conscious thing. Your brain just did it for survival, okay? So... If it's automatic, but it's also partially within your control, take the part you can control and utilize it to your advantage. So when you do the breathing technique, it's a quick inhalation. Exhale very, very slowly until you get to the bottom of the breath. Don't force it all the way out because sometimes that can make you feel like you're short of breath. And then you will inhale quickly and start hyperventilating. You don't want that. So just until the end of the natural exhalation, then a quick breath in again slowly let it out. I did that for two and a half hours. I breathed like that for two and a half hours. And it kept me calm the whole time. No fight or flight. Because when you're paying attention to your breath, you're not thinking about, oh my goodness, I'm in this big tube and it's really cramped and it's uncomfortable and I'm getting hot. Keeping your mind present as opposed to chasing all of these anxious inducing ideas. So being present is calming. Being in touch with your body is calming. Controlling your breath is calming. When you do that, it's one moment, then another moment, then another moment. And you're just spinning the same moment over and over and over again in your head. But it's all very calm. And you can do this constantly. I've taught myself, because I've been meditating consistently over the past 27 years. And my body has turned this into a habit. So now I'm just a deep breather if there is such a category. And that's one of the reasons why I'm able to remain calm under stress most of the time. I have my freak out. You know it. I post about it because I'm very honest and transparent with you that nothing I've learned guarantees a perfect existence because I'm still a human being. But what it does is it makes the journey a hell of a lot more manageable and opens up the window and the doors to more joy, which is really a big goal for all of us. So something as simple as being able to tune into your breathing and using it deliberately, strategically, can radically change the experience you have of life and especially stressful situations. So I wanted to share that strategy with you and hopefully it will benefit you. I strongly encourage you to share this with anybody that has anxiety issues because even if they're just sitting around and there's not a whole lot going on, you know darn well their head is driving them nuts or actually they're using their thoughts to drive themselves nuts. So share it with them. Share your feedback with me so I know if this has been helpful. Feel free to ask me any questions you have. And remember, no matter what's going on, you're good enough. And thanks for being you.